We are live. Hey, everybody. Howdy. Aaron Voster here, and thank you for learning about MS with me. I have been looking forward to live streaming with you guys all week. I am super happy that you're going to join me today. I have a lot to go over with you. It's about 5 o'clock Eastern Standard Time on Saturday. 25 people have jumped online. Thank you, everyone. My name is Aaron Boster, uh, and thanks for learning about MS with me. I have a lot planned out. I actually took notes, and I have an entire page of topics that I am excited to talk to you about today. Um, a couple housekeeping issues as we get rolling. As you jump online, please tell me where you're coming in from. There's Sylvia from London. Hey, how are you? Um, I've got uh, Darlene who's here. Uh, BK Holly is here. Uh, I, so many friends are jumping online. Debbie Hall is here. So as you uh, join the live stream, include where you're calling in from. That is super fun for me to see where the members of this global village are coming in from, where we're forming this global community. So please include that. I also wanted to invite you uh, to drink what I drink. So I have these fantastic Perrier little um, uh, beverages. These are pink grapefruit uh, because I think they're delicious. So when I drink, you drink. Um, this is a water drinking game. I'm going to be upping my water game right now. Um, some of you have participated in the uh, MS water challenge. So during this live stream, I challenge you to grab a glass of water. And when I take a sip, you take a sip. So we'll get our fluid hydration going on. So I also am going to ask, um, as some moderators come online, and let me just see, thus far there are no moderators, but as moderators come on, uh, as I've done in the past, I'm gonna ask you guys to uh, read the questions, identify questions that sound fantastic, and copy and paste them, right? Question and then paste the question there. It helps me a great deal because the moderator's names come up blue, so it's really easy in the live stream excuse me, for me to see them. They kind of stand out. And that way I can pick up all questions. As always, if I don't get to a question that you leave in the comment section, I make note of it and I'll either answer it in a future live stream or I'll answer it in an individual video. Um, to that end, I wanted to uh, just go over two last things. I can't diagnose you on the internet. I, I can't provide you medical care uh, through uh, this chat box. So please, as you ask your questions and make your comments, keep in mind that I can't give you personal medical advice. This entire channel is about empowering, energizing, and educating people impacted by MS. And really, the, this what I provide for you, I hope, um, is some uh, MS education. So in that vein, please make sure that your questions are generalizable so that everyone can benefit. Um, just makes things a lot easier. There's Matt Z. What's up, Matt? Matt, I'm, I'm asking that the moderators, like before, identify questions and then paste them so that I can see them, write question, and then just copy that entire question. And if you'd be willing to do that, Matt, I would greatly appreciate it. Um, that's helped so much in the past. And uh, the last thing uh, that I, I wanted to go over with you is uh, a lot of fun stuff that I want to talk about today. I have this entire list that I am super excited about. Um, I just came back from the American Academy of Neurology. So I was in Philadelphia for the middle of this week. The AAN, I think I heard like 13 or 15,000. Um, I have no idea how many neurologists, but it's the uh, national meeting for neurology. Now, MS is a subfield of neurology, and I was there. I presented a poster, and I have several other updates related to disease-modifying therapies that I'm excited to share with you. So we'll be doing that today. Um, also today, I wanted to go over some of uh, this past week's videos that I put out. So I put out three videos, and so I'm just going to highlight those. Uh, there's a video uh, that was actually part of a former CME we did two months back uh, by some amazing neurophysical therapists talking about walking in MS. So I want to discuss that briefly. I also answered two viewers' questions in two separate videos. So one of them had to deal with the concept of functional reserve and pushing past it. So what happens when you push past your functional reserve? The other one that I published this morning um, is uh, 
about steroids and is it required or is it really important that you take steroids with relapses? So I'm going to hit on that. I also have some other uh, exciting news. Today, I participated in the Ohio Health uh, team uh, at the MS Walk here in Columbus, Ohio. That was at the zoo. Uh, last week, uh, my family and I participated in the walk in Dayton. And so that's something that we look forward to doing every year. And I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, but before we get rolling, I, I want to share with you guys a personal crazy thing that happened today. So this is not about MS. Uh, this is just about my awesome family. And if this is not something that's exciting to you in the post, then you can skip past it. But honestly, this was insane. All right. So uh, as many of you know, we have a lot of pets at my house. We have my dog who's down by my feet, uh, River. Uh, we also have the seven chickens outside that provide seven fresh eggs every day. We have uh, two ferrets, June and Steve. Uh, they're my kids' ferrets. And I have to tell you that ferrets are kind of actually awesome. And they're kept in a really big cage that has multiple levels. And sometimes my wife or my kids will let them run around the house. And my son has a snake. So he's got a ball python named Slytherine. Um, which is kind of a, a cool pet. And so he's kept in an aquarium in my son's room. So here we go. Drinking game, guys. All right. So we came back from the MS walk and we needed to buy a new uh, heat lamp light bulb for Slytherin's cage to keep him warm because his light had burned out this morning. And we went to a local pet store and picked up one of these bulbs and I asked if they had live rats because that's what he eats. And they said, we don't have live rats, but we have live mice. So I picked up two live mice. Now, this is the first time that I've bought um, mice or rats from this particular store where I normally get them from, which is an awesome place where we bought uh, the snake. They give them to me in a Tupperware. Well, it's not exactly a Tupperware, but it's a plastic container that locks tight. And so this pet store was different. It put the two mice into a cardboard box, which I didn't think anything about. So we all came home and my son and I went upstairs and we fixed the light bulb so that the snake's aquarium could stay nice and warm. And then we dropped in the first mouse and uh, put the cage lid back on and Slytherine ate his first meal. And as per our usual, we put the box with the mouse on top of the cage. So there was one mouse in the aquarium being eaten by the snake and his second part of his dinner was up on top. And we like to wait a little while to make sure he's uh, completely swallowed his first meal before we give him his second. So my son's playing a video game in the other room and I was putzing around downstairs. And when I came back upstairs to give Slytherin the second mouse, it was gone. So I had forgot that this wasn't a plastic container with a sealed lid. No, this was a cardboard container and the darn thing chewed through it. So I thought this is horrible. So with my head hung low, I walked into the room where my wife was and I had to tell her the truth that I had let a mouse escape in our house. And I was anticipating her not being super excited about that. Well, she very calmly said, no big deal. Just let out the ferrets. Well, that's freaking awesome. I forgot that ferrets are predators that hunt mice or any other small rodent. And so I let the ferrets out and a half an hour later, June had the mouse trapped uh, in the corner and she was attacking it. And I easily walked over and picked the mouse up and dropped it in the snake's cage. So, so today having ferrets was more useful than just having them as a pet. They literally served a fantastic purpose collecting a mouse that I let escape in the house. So kind of a funny story. <laughs> I was kind of excited about telling you about that. All right. So let me uh, answer a couple of viewer questions. And then I want to go to this list and discuss the things uh, that I'm so excited. Uh, I made a list to talk about. And I see that Matt Z has been doing a bang up job. Thank you very much, Matt. I really appreciate your help. And so Matt has identified a couple questions. And the first live stream question I'm going to answer tonight is from Cindy who asks, what dose of steroids do you recommend? So that's a great question, Cindy. So um, I put out a video this morning where I posed the question, do you really need steroids uh, for an attack? So when you have an MS attack, a, um, a new uh, neurological symptom with findings on exam, 
that's been around for at least a day or old MS symptoms that have been gone for quite some time and have now returned and are lasting for at least a day in the absence of a fever. This is an attack. If I give you an example, it would be when you have an optic neuritis and you start to lose vision in your eye and it hurts when you move it and it stays that way and actually gets worse over a couple of days. So do you need steroids? And if you'd like to see my answer to that, I'm posting in the chat a link to that video. So here, um, so here, Cindy is asking the question, what dose of steroids? So the answer, Cindy, I'm giving is for treating a relapse or an exacerbation. When we give a uh, steroid treatment for relapse, we don't use the same kind of dosing that you use with like asthma or in, excuse me, rheumatologic conditions like uh, rheumatoid arthritis or lupus. Those are typically taken orally and they're typically lower doses like 20 to 80 milligrams taken every day. This is very different. This is a extremely high dose for a short period of time. And it's typically given in a very, very high dose so that it can penetrate into the central compartment. And the typical dose is a thousand milligrams of an IV solumedrol. So that's a liquid uh, that's given through the vein. And that's probably the most common way in the United States that we give steroids. And the typical dose is a thousand milligrams. Now, you can also give high dose steroids through pills. And so you then have to just do a conversion. So if you're going to do it orally, pills, prednisone pills, the typical dose given is 1,250 milligrams, so 1,250. So this is 125 milligrams higher than solumedrol because that's what's lost when you digest it in your body. Another way of giving high-dose oral is to give decadron, and this is typically something you have to compound, and it's 200 milligrams of decadron. Um, and so, again, I'm not giving you medical advice here. I'm just providing some education about the typical doses that are used. Now, when treating an attack, most commonly, we give either three or five days of consecutive steroids. It is my practice not to give uh, a, a taper afterwards. We did some research uh, that demonstrated that the taper doesn't change the, uh, the long-term outcome of the attack, so it doesn't help you handle it better. There are some patients that require a taper, and this is the minority. I, I see this maybe once or twice a year because the exposure to the short course of steroids probably uh, diminishes the, their own adrenal function. And so when the steroids wear off, they don't feel very good for a couple of days. And in those rare situations, we do give them a medrol dose pack. Great question. Thank you for asking it. And thank you, Matt, the moderator, for queuing that up for me. So let's do one more question, uh, and then I'm going to jump in uh, to my list over here. And I'm just kind of perusing my, my list. So this next question uh, Matt put up from Sonia, who writes, Vertigo can hopefully be treated with a physical therapist. Oh, sorry, this is a conversation that Matt's having. Got it. All right, so the next question, whoops, comes from Willie Edwards, who asks, any specific amount of vitamin D3 one should take? My answer is 5,000, and I agree with Matt's answer. The real, the real answer, honestly, is you need to supplement your vitamin D3 to achieve a given level. So knowing what your uh, blood level is allows you to adjust it. And that needs to be done with a doctor. Uh, so what we do at our center is we draw people's blood and we look at their vitamin D uh, total level. And our goal is typically between 50 and 100. So we don't want it below 50 and we don't want it above 100. We want it right in that range. Now, Ohio doesn't have a lot of sun. It's actually pretty nice out today. Uh, but seven months out of the year, there's not a lot of sun and we, we get vitamin D naturally through the sun. And so we have to supplement here in Ohio. When I check levels, they're very often below 50 and a lot of times they're below 30. In other words, they're like really low. And so we may give various doses of vitamin D3, uh, but the most common dose is exactly what Matt listed. It's 5,000 international units daily. We have sometimes gone as high as 50,000 twice a week. And we have gone as low as not giving any at all. Um, but most commonly, people are taking four to 6,000 international units a day. And D3 is the one that you want to take because it's handled better in the human body. It's absorbed better than other forms of D, like D2. Now, I think I, I've shown you this awesome hat before. I'm loving my hat. 
Um, I have a family that gave me this hat. It's got this really cool logo and it says F-U-M-S. So I haven't figured out what that means yet, um, but, but you can kind of come up with something in your head. And if we flip it around, I know I've shown you this, but I just love it. If we flip it around, it says Kick MS, which is something that I really enjoy doing. And so shout out to the folks that gave me this hat. I love it. Thank you very much. Um, let's do uh, another question here. Um, I'm enjoying answering your questions. Thank you, guys. So is there another question queued up? I'm scrolling through. Yeah, here's a question. Matt queued up a question from Laura who asks, how do you feel about vitamin patches or pills or liquid? So I don't have a lot of knowledge about getting vitamins through a patch topically. If it's been approved by the FDA, uh, then I have a degree of certainty that they checked it out. And if it's not, we it, like if it's not regulated by the FDA, we, we may not know exactly. I don't have a lot of experience differentiating liquid versus pill versus patch. Um, actually, I've never used a patch to, to provide vitamins, but some of my patients take uh, liquid vitamin D3. Many of my patients take oral medication. Uh, I really can't say too much more because it's not something I know very much about. All right, so I think we're caught up with questions for the moment. And so I'm gonna use this time uh, to talk about the AAN, uh, so the American Academy of Neurology. Generally speaking, I don't like the AAN. It's too big of a meeting for me. There's a gazillion neurologists there. Neurologists that do stroke, neurologists that do neuromuscular, neurologists that do uh, cancer, neurologists that do MS, um, neurologists that do headache, uh, neurologists that do pain. There's a whole host of neurologists, sleep doctors. And it's not uh, enough multiple sclerosis for my taste. I'm a sub sub specialist. I don't do general neurology. I only do multiple sclerosis. And so selfishly, uh, when I go to a meeting, I want there to be just stuff about MS. My favorite meetings are Ectrums, uh, which I think is in September of this year. Um, Ectrums is a giant meeting. It's an international meeting. It's only about MS, and that's my fave. Another favorite meeting of mine is the Consortium of MS Centers, or the CMSC. That's an American meeting uh, held every year where all the centers that take care of MS patients come together. Uh, and that's an awesome meeting, and I really like going to that one. I haven't been to the AN in several years, but I went this time predominantly because I had a poster. So one of the ways that you share medical knowledge at a conference is you give a platform presentation. So you're in a giant stadium hall, and you're up on stage, and you deliver a presentation to you know thousands of people that are sitting there listening. Uh, and that's really awesome. And actually, my friend, Dr. Nicholas, gave a platform presentation. And so shout out to Dr. Nicholas, uh, my partner at Ohio Health, because that's a, a huge honor and really cool. Now, another way to share knowledge and to exchange information and ideas at a Congress is to present a poster. And there, it's much easier to present a poster than a platform because there's a lot more space for posters. And so I have a poster that I did uh, with a large group of people. And so that was presented there and they asked me to stand by it and so I went to the AAN. Now, what does it mean to stand by a poster? So you, you create this poster, which uh, describes a scientific experiment that you did. And then for a certain time, so from like 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. on a given day, you stand by it. And people walk around and they come up to you and they talk to you and you describe your poster. And then you have a scientific exchange of information. One of the really cool ways to use posters is as a prelude to writing a, a paper because you can uh, do an experiment, a clinical trial or some other experiment, and then you can present it as a poster and get feedback from other doctors and neurologists and scientists who might point out flaws or things that you wanna do better. And it gives you a chance to kind of test out your ideas before you write a formal paper. So we wrote a, a poster and it looked at this concept called number needed to treat. And I'm not gonna talk a lot of statistics here because that would maybe probably bore you, but number needed to treat is a statistic where you say, how many humans do I have to put on a given therapy to prevent one bad event? And that's the number needed to treat. And so we looked at the number needed to treat for two of the MS medications, 
Abagio, which is an oral pill for MS, and cladribine or, or mavenclad, which is another pill for MS. And what we found was pretty cool. We found that for both drugs, you need to put five people on that therapy, whether that be Abagio or cladribine, in order to prevent one attack. So the number needed to treat to prevent one attack was five. Now, if you instead look at confirmed disability progression, so getting worse and maintaining that worsening for at least three months, so that's called confirmed disability progression. And for both drugs, you needed to put 15 people on to prevent one progression, both for Abagio and Mavenclad. So that was what my poster was about. And I really had a good time standing by it. And I talked to a lot of different folks about it. And so I feel like I was able to share some information that's, I think, very clinically relevant. And they were able to kind of give me feedback. And so I, I really enjoyed doing that. So there was also a lot of uh, other things going on, obviously, at the AN and some cool things about MS. And so I'll just share two of them with you. One of them is about the MS drug Tysabri. And Tysabri is a monoclonal antibody. It's given through the vein. Uh, and it is a highly effective medicine. It's been out for um, now quite some time. It's been out since 2004. And despite being an older medicine, uh, it remains, in my opinion, in the top three of efficacy. So pretty solid stuff. And it's been given traditionally every four weeks. So it's an infusion every 28 days, actually. So just shy of four weeks. And that means that you typically have 13 infusions a year. There are some theories that you can decrease the risk of getting this infection called PML if you extend the dosing. And previous investigations found that waiting three months is a really, really bad idea because the drug wears off and people have MS activity, which is bad. So then we looked at doing eight weeks and eight weeks had some problems with it. Some people unbound their receptors. Six weeks, however, seems to be the bomb. And it looks like at six weeks interval dosing, you might actually decrease the risk to get PML. Now, whether or not you actually decrease the risk to get PML, I think that six week dosing is really cool because it saves the, the family money because they're getting less infusions. They don't have to come in as often, so it makes it more convenient and it does not decrease the efficacy. It's the same efficacy. So I really like seeing that information there. I thought that was really cool. Um, hold on one second. All right. Sorry about that. I got a text message. There was a, another really interesting um, presentation that was given about a different MS medicine, Ocrelizumab or Ocrevus. And so Ocrevus is also one of the top three MS medicines from an efficacy standpoint. It's a really good one. And it's given through a vein twice a year. So it's given every six months. So this was a presentation that looked at the, it's called the pharmacokinetics or the pharmacodynamics, which is really like how is the drug absorbed in your body and how long does it stay in your body before you get rid of it? And although the dosing is every six months, what they found was you, you're, if you are little, like if you're a small person, that dose every six months is going gonna, is gonna to be a higher exposure your body is going to see more ocrevus if your body's little. I guess the way to think about it is if you had a small glass of water and you put in two drops of food coloring, it would be more concentrated. It would be a darker color. You'd have a higher exposure than if you had a giant glass of water and you put in two drops. And going back to ocrevus, if you're a little person, the dose of ocrevus is going to have a higher exposure in your body. And if you're a big person, you're going to have a lower exposure. And so that's really interesting because it opens the door to think about hypothetically giving smaller people less frequent dosing. Now, I'm not recommending this to you. I'm just sharing with you some information that was presented at the AN. And one could conceptually, if the person's small enough, maybe dose them hypothetically every seven months. And conversely, if you're a larger sized person, when you get ocrevus, you're not going to have as high of an exposure in your body when it distributes. And so hypothetically, you could give the drug not six months, but every five months. And so I thought that was super, super interesting. I was, I was really into that. And so those are three updates that I wanted to share with you guys about the AAN. Um, let's jump back in and find some questions. 
I, I saw that there's some questions coming down the line. Uh, and so let me scroll here and see what's up. Um, Matt is still helping me out and I'm grateful. Thank you, Matt. Um, and Loving Dale asks the following question. What does it mean when the MRI says you have chronic mature sites of demyelination? Are they black holes? So I wonder if you're quoting what the radiologist wrote in his report, chronic mature sites of demyelination. Now I've been doing MS for about a decade and a half and I've never read that term, chronic mature sites of demyelination. What could that mean? I'm not sure. It could mean that there's a white spot that's been there for a really long time. Or it could mean that there's a black hole. Uh, and, and I don't know, that is not like a, a standard, um, that's not a standard met, uh, way of talking about an MRI. Um, and so I would need a better context and I probably need to look at the film, but that's not like standard radiology language. So it's kind of interesting. All right, let's answer another question. Awkwardly, Allie wrote, um, it's time It's time if your balance puts your you in danger of injury. So there's an ongoing discussion, sorry. Um, all right, so Chuck O is here. Chuck's another moderator. What's up, Chuck? Um, and let's see if there's other questions. All right, so right now there's no more questions for the moment, and so I thought I would bring you another really cool update. But first I'm gonna open up another one of these bad boys. So remember our water game. I'm encouraging you to drink when I drink. I'm gonna up my water game and hydrate myself, and I'm hopeful that you guys will do the same. You know, there's 134 people online, and that's awesome. If each person gave me a thumbs up, I would go ballistic. Um, to think that uh, to get 134 thumbs up would be really sweet. There's 38 thumbs up right now. And so if you're feeling the love, if you're digging what we're doing right now, give it a thumbs up for me. I think uh, the moderators explained to me before, you have to um, close the screen, hit a thumbs up, then jump back into the live stream. I'm not sure if that's true or not. But if you could give me a thumbs up, I would totally love that. That would be super. Thank you. And uh, another sip of water. All right. So we talked about the AAN. Um, this is a really cool update. There's a, an MS medicine. I did a live stream about it a little while ago called uh, Mazent, which is saponamod. It's the newest, uh, one of the two newest pills to come out. And it's uh, a derivative of Jelenia. And so Mazent requires some genetic testing to be done so that we know how to properly dose it. And my partner, Dr. Nicholas, dosed the first person with Mazent, she said, in the country this past week. Um, and I just think that's kind of awesome. Uh, Dr. Nicholas is an amazing doctor. Uh, she's my partner. Uh, she's fantastic at Ohio Health. And I think it's kind of awesome. Uh, you know, several years back, uh, we, were, um, we were really early in dosing Lemtrada. And several years back, we were the first in the, the, the world, actually, to dose Ocrevus. And I'm, I think it's really awesome that Dr. Nicholas, one of my partners, was the first to dose Mazin, uh, so she tells me. Uh, you know, and I think that speaks to our desire. We want to uh, make you the most awesome version of you possible. And we consider ourselves specialists in multiple sclerosis. And I think that means that it's incumbent upon us to bring you cutting-edge options. It doesn't mean that we are going to use every option or that we're going to use uh, certain things in certain situations, not at all. But I think that when you come to a comprehensive center, they need to have at their disposal everything and they need to know how to use everything. That doesn't mean they're going to use everything, but they shouldn't uh, say, oh, we, we don't do that. Um, and I know there's some centers that completely avoid certain medicines. Um, I'm really proud of Dr. Nicholas. I'm proud to be your friend. I think it's super cool that she did that. So uh, I, I wanted to share that with you guys. So looking for a few more questions. Uh, here's a question that Sherry Williams wrote in, or Wilson wrote in, sorry, Sherry, Sherry Wilson. So she asks, can you have progression without evidence on MRI? And the answer is yes. So progression is a clinical definition. It's when your neurological exam gets worse in the absence of an attack. And the MRI does not have to reflect that. In fact, it oftentimes doesn't. In the setting of progression, we typically don't see lots of new enhancing lesions. We typically see a brain that is shrinking. 
uh, and we can see uh, that, that the ventricles are getting bigger. This atrophy uh, correlates oftentimes with progression, not always, but to answer your question, no, you, you don't have to have changes on MRI to progress. Uh, that's a clinical definition. That was a great question. So Divine is with us. Divine, how are you? I uh, hope you're doing really well. And, and Divine asks, uh, with beta seron stay uh, on the market due to the heart risk, will beta seron stay on the market? So I would imagine that at least a generic version of high dose interferon beta 1b, which is what that is, will be on the market. Um, and I, I don't know if cardiovascular concerns will rise to the point where they yank it from the market, uh, but I don't have a lot of information to, to weigh in any further. Uh, and so uh, more to come. Here's a question from, and this one, uh, the moderator Chuck O is helping out. So Chuck, thank you for helping Matt, help me. Uh, I'm grateful for your help. Uh, it's so much easier to find questions when you guys copy and paste them. So thank you very much. We've got 85 thumbs up. I'm looking for a few more. Let's see if we can crest 100, guys. Hook me up with a, a couple thumbs up if you're digging this. So uh, Chuck O copied a question of Jeremy Stringer. So what's up, Jeremy? How are you? He asks, what does the MS medical community know about the failures of generic Impira? What can be done about that? So Impira is the trade name for a pill called 4-aminopyridine. Um, and I have some videos that talk about heat, uh, heat intolerance. And in, in, a, in a few of them, I actually describe how Impira works. Uh, so Impira is the trade name for 4-aminopyridine. In Europe, it's called Fampira with an F. And Jeremy asks about generic. So I don't know um, the, the details uh, of what happened when the drug's life cycle ended. Um, I, I know that there's a period of time where drugs can become generic. And sometimes when a drug is getting ready to become generic, the manufacturer will petition the government and say, not yet, not yet. Um, and so I, I am struggling with my patients because as we led up to it becoming generic, it, all the assistance programs ended. And so many of my patients weren't able to get access to the drug. Now they've now been reinstated, which makes me think that maybe there's a delay in, in making this generic. And I don't know why, but maybe it's because uh, successful lobbying by the company to say, leave it on label for whatever reason. Um, Formunopyridine has been around for quite some time. We used to have it compounded at a special old, old timey compounding pharmacy where they would literally make the pills. You can actually still get it compounded, although they won't necessarily do the exact same dose. Um, four meter pyridine, I'm sorry if there's a, you're hearing a noise outside. Uh, my wife is actually building some type of wooden apparatus. I think she, she's building some type of benches for, for a table. So if you're hearing hammering and stuff, uh, that's my wife outside doing some construction. <laughs> um, let's look at another question. We're updated on questions, so I can uh, go back to my list of stuff I wanted to talk about. Uh, and I want to give a shout out to my daughter, um, Betty. Um, my daughter is in middle school, and she just did her first musical, uh, Suzical the Musical. So Suzical the Musical uh, was her first musical, and she destroyed it. She didn't want to do it, um, and there was a little parental pressure for her to do it, even though she was nervous but she's an amazing singer and oh my goodness, I was blown away. I got to see her Thursday night and Friday night uh, and I, I love the performance. To be honest, I didn't think that I was gonna enjoy watching middle schoolers uh, do an hour production of singing and dancing. In fact, that sounds horrible to me, but I was overjoyed, not just because my daughter rocked um, with this amazing singing voice and she was super sassy, but they were all really good. Um, and so I was really blown away by that. So I'm a proud parent uh, and that was really awesome. And so I just wanted to give a shout out to her because that was freaking cool. Um, and she discovered that she really likes theater. I did a lot of theater when I was a kid. It was a big part of my growing up. And so the fact that she has found this to be cool is something that I really am excited about. All right, so uh, let's look for some more questions. And I'm scrolling along here. Um, 
And so Matt says, guys, uh, please slow down with the questions. Uh, it's hard to type that fast. Um, and uh, Matt and Chuck, if you miss a question that you would, I'm going to go through them later and I'll, I'll extract all the questions we didn't get to. So guys, please don't, um, please don't be worried if I don't get to your question right now. Um, there's 99 thumbs up. Uh, I'm going to take a drink and hope that someone will hook me up with the hundredth thumbs up. Here we go. There it is. Yeah, that's awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, that's really, really cool. Thank you for that. There's another thing that I wanted to actually check on my phone um, about this channel. And so let me take a look and show you something cool. Give me a second, guys. Look, we did it. So I don't know if you can see that. Um, well, I don't know if you can see that. But that's uh, a readout of 11,000 subscribers. So today we just crested 11,000 subscribers. So thank you very, very much. Um, thank you for watching this channel. Thank you for um, uh, sticking with me. Uh, thank you for putting up with the fact that I'm not very good at videography. Thank you for your comments, of course. And thank you all for, for joining me on these live streams. I am so excited that there are 11,000 people in this global online community. Um, it's ever growing and uh, I, I adore it. Uh, I was so excited to jump online with you guys uh, today and thank you. There's 136 of those uh, folks that are on right now. Uh, and that means a lot to me. So we hit 11,000 guys. Thank you. As many of you know, it's my goal uh, to reach as many people impacted by MS as possible. Now, when I say impacted by MS, that means a, a person who has MS. That means the family members of someone who has MS. That means the friend of someone who has MS. And that might mean a practitioner providing care to someone who has MS. In other words, I'm trying to reach as many people in the global online village as possible. So you guys watching this, if you know someone that has MS or someone who's impacted by MS, um, you might do me a solid and let them know about this channel. We've reached 11,000 and I am overjoyed by that. Um, I started this channel to help my patients um, up their game and learn between visits. And I, I, I hope that it serves that purpose. I also hope that I'm able to reach um, people out in all throughout the globe this way. Um, and it really feels awesome. So thank you. Super, super cool. Um, really um, something that I never anticipated and I'm absolutely in love with. All right, so let's look at some more questions and see what's cooking. Um, Eva asks, besides slowing down progression of MS, oh, sorry, um, I think this is a question. Besides slowing down progression of MS, can you use symptoms? Hmm, I'm not exactly sure what's meant by that question. But if I uh, interpret it, I would simply say, when we treat MS, there's really three ways that we're treating MS all at the same time. The first way is called episodic care, because you don't do it all the time, you only do it in certain episodes, and that's treating an attack. The second way is treating symptoms. Symptoms are chronic things that bother us, like you had an attack of burning leg, it got 90% better and you're left with 10% burning leg. Or you've developed bladder urgency and are constantly going to the bladder, bathroom, and sometimes have accidents. So those are, are chronic symptoms. So the second way we take care of MS is we treat symptoms. And we treat symptoms separate from treating an attack or from slowing the disease down, which is the third one. We treat symptoms to raise the quality of your life. Now, the third one, as I just kind of spilled the beans, is slowing the disease down. And you know that's where I come in saying, I want you to be four for four and your fight against MS because there are four things that I want you to do. Supplement low levels of vitamin D, do not smoke cigarettes, don't smoke tobacco because it speeds up MS, exercise as part of your lifestyle and take a disease modifying therapy, make sure it's working. So we do all three of those things at the same time. And it's my opinion that in order to have considered ourselves uh, as practitioners doing a good job, we have to slow your disease down and raise your quality of life. So we go four for four to slow the disease down and we treat symptoms to raise your quality of life. So um, I hope that helped uh, answer that question. 
So um, before I talk about the videos uh, or before I talk about uh, the walks, I, I do have some questions from prior live streams that I thought I would answer with you guys. And so this first question was written by Mandy. Uh, Mandy's last name is G-O-U-G-H. So I'm going to guess it's Mandy Go or Gall. Um, so if I said that wrong, I'm sorry, Mandy. And Mandy writes, what findings do you normally see in CSF fluid to help diagnosis? So cerebral spinal fluid or CSF uh, is fluid that bathes the brain. Um, it bathes the brain and spinal cord the, and it really acts as a cushion and it brings nutrients to the brain and spinal cord and it pulls, um, you know, metabolites and waste away. And when you have MS, you can have changes in the cerebral spinal fluid. About 90% of people with MS will have these changes at some point in their life, which means a negative CSF doesn't mean that you don't have MS. And so because I don't do spinal taps all the time and someone like every couple of years, we don't do that. If you're negative, um, but you meet criteria from an MRI, then the negative doesn't mean that you don't have MS. So certainly there are plenty of people that are negative, have normal spinal fluid. But the question is, is what are the changes that you see in the spinal fluid that would suggest MS? So there's really two. Um, the first one is an elevation of the IgG index. So what does that mean? IgG um, is a doctor term for antibodies. So you're measuring a type of antibody. And the IgG index is the amount of antibodies in the spinal fluid divided by the amount of antibodies in the bloodstream. And it's a mathematical calculation. And um, if it was one to one, it would be a ratio, it would just be one. And so typically there's a lot more antibodies in the bloodstream than in the spinal fluid. And so the ratio is typically less than 0.7. When it's over 0.7, that's an elevation in the IgG index. And that is something that we see in MS. So if you have that, it increases the likelihood that you have MS. And actually it's part of the, the um, diagnostic criteria to some extent. The other way is to look for oligoclonal bands. So these oligoclonal bands are, are also essentially measuring the exact same thing, antibodies, but they do it uh, in a much different way. And there's a, a plate and you run spinal fluid out on it and you hook up some electricity. And so it kind of stretches out based on the weight and it creates these bands. And so you can look at the bands in the spinal fluid and you can look at the bands in the blood. And if you have two or more bands in the spinal fluid that you don't see in the blood, those are called unpaired bands. And two or more unpaired oligoclonal bands means the same thing as an elevation in the IgG index. It's, it tells you that there's inflammation in the central compartment because you have more antibodies in the central compartment with the spinal fluid than you're used to having or that you're supposed to have. So I have an entire video on cerebral spinal fluid on this channel. Um, and I don't know if I'm clever enough to find it, but I'm going to try really quickly. Um, let me see. Let me see if I can do this, guys. If I can find it. Yeah. So I did do it. I'm going to paste into uh, the live stream chat a link to this video on spinal fluid. So this is a video I did a while back, CSF. There, so you guys can check that out. Um, and that'll go into some uh, length. That's a 12 minute video on spinal fluid. Uh, so a lot of your answers will hopefully be found there. So I'm gonna answer another one that uh, someone had sent me a while back. Uh, and this is from none other than AJ's HR. So AJ's HR has been with me on this channel since uh, I can remember um, and helps out a lot. And so, oh, sorry. She was a moderator last time. And the, the actual question is from Ty Shalena, so T-H-A-I-S-H-E-L-E-N-A. -E -E so I, I might not have said that right, but Ty Shalena 110. And uh, that nice person asks, is it possible to have a relapse um, when there's no inflammation? So can you have a relapse when there's no inflammation? And um, the, the answer is probably not. Now, inflammation isn't always seen. 
So if you mean, can you have an attack and not have changes on the MRI? The answer is yes, you can. You can have an attack without MRI changes. MRI changes show you inflammation, but the absence doesn't mean there isn't any. And I believe there's, uh, there's things going on in MS that the MRI doesn't completely characterize. In fact, that's a fact. We know that. And so, um, whereas I don't think you can have a, a actual proper attack without inflammation, um, you can have an attack without the way that we measure inflammation showing up. Uh, so I hope that made sense. And uh, I really like that question, actually. So we'll do another one. Uh, this is from uh, Patty. So MS uh, ended for life, Patty Long. And Patty wrote in a while back on the live stream and asked this question. Is there a lifetime limit on the number of IV steroids a person should have? So that's a really good question. So the answer is there is not a set number like 112, that there isn't a set number um, of how many times you can get steroids or the total exposure to steroids. However, chronic exposure to steroids can really hurt you. And uh, if you're getting pulses of steroids too frequently, there's some several, several bad things can happen. So when you give someone five days of steroids and then stop, it's not gonna mess up their endocrine system, it's not going to thin their bones. Um, it's not going to do a lot of things that you can see if you give steroids over a, a very long period of time or if you give many, many bouts of steroids. Uh, another very big concern is that it can increase the risk for infection. Um, and so I'll share with you a, a story, uh, something that's hard for me to share, um, about a patient of mine who's also a good friend. Uh, and their disease was progressing and uh, we were throwing the kitchen sink at it, trying to impact and slow the disease, but it wasn't working. And so we decided to do kind of old school. We started to get steroids, but we were giving them not like three days for an attack and stop, but we were going to give them uh, one big dose of a thousand milligrams of a solumedrol every two weeks. And we did that for a couple months. And my patient, my friend, felt like they were doing better. And then we spaced it out to every month. And we did that for a couple months. And then we were going to space it out again. And they got Legionella pneumonia. And they were in the intensive care unit. And I'm afraid what had happened was the chronic exposure to steroids had lowered their immune system so much that they were at increased risk of getting a pneumonia. Now, they survived, they're doing okay, but boy, it was a terrible experience and a very, very um, heartfelt experience and it was a lesson. And so, whereas no, there isn't a lifetime limit, we have to be very, very cautious. Also, um, as you age, you're at increased risk of infection and your bones get thinner and steroids can make that worse. Also, if you have, um, say, bipolar disorder or diabetes or some other condition that would be impacted by steroids, we have to factor that in. So thank you, Patty, for asking that question. I really appreciate it. So let's see about some viewer questions today. Um, I'm going to jump back into our live stream. And let's see uh, some questions that we didn't get to. I'm just cleaning up my desktop so I can find stuff. All right. So Matt is still at it. Matt, I am grateful you've been helping out a lot. Chucko is still helping out a lot. Thank you, gentlemen. I'm really appreciative. Okay, so I'm trying to find where we left off with the questions. Here we go. So Sherry Wilson uh, asked, "How can you tell if you've gone from secondary How can you tell if you go from relapsing MS to progressive MS or secondary progressive MS?" So um, I have a video that I'm going to try to find while I'm talking to you on progression, where I talk about that in some length. Um, and so I'm going to post this video called what is progression. Um, and this video, uh, is, is uh, 11 minutes long and it goes into some depth. So progress, progression. And I answer that in some detail with the video that I just posted, but let me answer you at least in a short fashion here live. When you have not had an attack in a long time, and yet your neurological exam is getting worse, this is concerning for progression. 
And I'm talking about over uh, pe- measuring it by a period of years, not months or weeks, but years. And so an example would be, I had my last attack eight years ago, doc, but um, I used to play golf twice a week. And uh, two years ago, I could only play once a week. And um, then later that year, I couldn't even finish one full game. So I started to do a half game. Uh, And this is the first year that I'm not able to golf at all. And I'm starting to use a cane. Um, I made that up. But the point that I was trying to convey is a slow, steady decline in neurological function, which would have obviously shown up on exam in the absence of an attack. And so really the take home here is that you can only determine if someone's in a progressive disease state when you look backwards. You have to look back retrospectively to be able to discern this. There's nothing you can do prospectively. Now, there is a really exciting um, uh, future, uh, things like neurofilm and light chain. Uh, This is a biomarker that might be able to give us some more clarity on when someone's progressing, but we don't have that available just yet. So I hope that helped. Let's look for another question. You know, the moderators also uh, clean up the um, live stream. Uh, So, you know, this is intended to be uh, a friendly place. This is intended to be a place of love uh, and of community. This is a global online village uh, and we don't have time for haters and shade. And so I really appreciate uh, the moderators for kind of watching out for me because I can't read them all. Clearing out things that might not be a good fit for this uh, live stream. So thank you guys. So uh, there's another question. This one is from Summer Lady uh, who writes, can CBD help with any MS symptoms? Um, So um, Summer Lady, how are you? And I've got a video for that that I'm going to try to find while I'm answering your question. Um, I did a a CME lecture on cannabis. And I'm going to try to post that for you. And uh, this is a... uh, quite a long lecture it's um is this the right one no no this is not the right one i'm sorry guys and bear with me i hope that this isn't really annoying if you find me uh if you find that it's really annoying then uh, let me know if it's taking too long um then uh i won't do this but i really want to give this link here it is uh, because it's a um it's an opportunity to to dive a little deeper. I'm failing at doing this, guys. I'm so sorry. Is this it? Yeah, I think that is. All right. Sorry, guys. I just found it, and I'm going to post it for you. No, this is not right. All right. Here we go. So check this out. This is a link that talks about THC and CBD and all things cannabinoid, CBD. I'm sorry that took so long. So CBD has been very, very poorly studied. Um, I I gave you the link there. But CBD has been very poorly studied in MS, like remarkably so. There is almost no literature looking uh, properly at CBD oil in MS. There is anecdotal evidence that it can help with pain and that it can help with spasticity. And I have many, many patients that tell me that they find CBD oil to be helpful and they may be absolutely right. I am not saying it doesn't work. I'm saying there's not evidence studying it. So I would tell you anecdotally talking to families with MS um, all day, every day, and a lot of people being open sharing with me about their use of cannabinoids and about CBD, which is not illegal, um, that they say it does help with pain and with spasticity. I, I also will point out that it's kind of expensive. Um, CBD oil can become really expensive and the price has been climbing, I think because um, of all the interest in uh, medical marijuana and cannabis. So if you wanna know more, check out that link that I posted down below. Um, and uh, yeah, tell me what you think. All right, so let's look for another question. This one is from uh, Chuck O, who writes, what does the number of lesions tell the neurologist? So I assume, Chuck, that you're talking about MRI lesions, so lesions on the brain and spinal cord. And those lesions tell us a lot of stuff. 
Um, the lesion location uh, tells us about MS and about where we expect to see deficits. The number of lesions gives us a sense of the burden of the disease and radiographically how bad it is. Overall, more lesions is worse than less lesions. Importantly, the biggest concern is, is the change over time. So if you have 100 lesions and then the next year you have 101, that's arguably better than if you have one lesion the next year you have two. Because in the second example, you doubled your lesion load. All that being said, in a given shot, snapshot in time, uh, more lesions typically correlates with worse MS and worse immune disease. So we've gone 55 minutes now, uh, we're approaching an hour, and I'm not ready to stop. Um, I hope that you guys aren't ready to stop. If you're still here with me, give me a thumbs up and let me know. There's 128 of you, and, and that's really, really cool. Remember our water game, when I drink, you drink. So let's look for um, another question here. So this question, let's see. Oh, where to go? Did I just lose it? Here's one. So Divine Misery asks, if you would keep treating with disease-modifying therapy, is there, if after every infusion, the patient ends up with pneumonia? Woo! So if um, you were on a therapy and that therapy made you get an infection, it's probably not going to work out. We have to have the risk-benefit of every single therapy you take, aspirin, Tylenol, um, Ocrevus, so let's use Ocrevus as an example. If you receive an infusion and then get a pneumonia, and then six months later you receive an infusion and get a pneumonia, that's a major problem. And I think the risk benefit there really has to be called into question. In that situation, I would probably consider finding a different option. And that's just an opinion. And I don't have enough information to give an answer for an individual. I'm just speaking philosophically about the risk benefit not being in your favor. Um, here's another question. ZA asks this question. Um, can you explain how gabapentin works and if it's addictive? So gabapentin um, is a medicine that was originally invented to treat seizures. Um, it works by stimulating uh, the gabinergic system, amongst other things, and it suppresses overactivity or uh, excitable neurons that are going to fire inappropriately. So that helps seizures because a seizure is an electrical storm in the brain. So if you can quiet down those neurons, kind of suppress them a little bit, then you could decrease how often someone has a seizure. Uh, gabapentin, and the trade name is Neurontin, is used very, very commonly off-label to treat pain. It is a great medicine for treating neuropathic pain. And there's a lot of things about it that are super. It comes in all kinds of different doses, uh, so you can give high doses, little doses, you can give it uh, just at night or sometimes four times a day. There's a lot of flexibility. I am not familiar with an addiction to Neurontin. Um, now, whenever I start a medicine, I ramp it up slowly. And whenever I stop a medicine, I decrease it slowly. Um, but I, I have not had patients tell me that they have dependence where they need more and more Neurontin to have an effect. And that is a, a, a part of addiction. And I have never heard of any patient having tolerance where the same dose just didn't help um, and they had to have larger and larger doses. So in my experience, the answer is no. All right, looking for a few other questions. And while we're waiting for it, here's a, here's a question. So Loving Dale asks, uh, where does the left centrum semiovalley of the brain um, and what is the control? Um, so that's radiology talk. So I suspect that uh, Loving Dale is looking at an MRI report. Um, so the left is obviously on the left side of the head. And the centrum semiovalley is this space sort of in the middle. Um, I can't throw up an MRI. Um, you could easily Google that and it would point to it. Um, just do an image search for centrum semiovalley and it would show it to you. It's actually a very large section. Um, it's not a specific organ, it's like a region. All right, so while we're waiting for some other questions, I'm gonna go back to my list and let's talk a little bit about um, the, the videos that I've put out. Uh, and so this past week, I put out three videos. The first one was on walking and this was from our CME that we did back in March. And so two amazing uh, 
uh, MS um, team members. So these are neurophysical therapists par excellence. They have a doctorate in neurophysical therapy. Um, Lauren Esposito, uh, and then also a gal named uh, Jessica uh, Petiti. Both of these women are phenomenal. Both of them work a lot with our MS patients, and they gave this really cool lecture. I'm going to post it here for you now. Uh, PT walking, walking with MS. And they did this really great uh, lecture talking about ambulation with MS. So if you have any questions about walking with MS, a walker, a cane, um, in, in, in various parts of walking with MS, this is a fantastic lecture. So I put that up this week. And uh, thus far, let's take a look and see how it's been doing. Um, I have a question for you guys about this. Uh, this. So there's been uh, 1,700 people that have seen this lecture. And if any of you have watched it, please give me a comment and let me know what you thought. Uh, did you like the CME lecture? Did you not like it? Um, most of my videos I'm making uh, on, uh, with my own camera, just one-on-one -on -one with you and me. This was a video that we recorded live. Also, what did you think of the content? Um, so let me know your thoughts there. Uh, the next video that I put out uh, this week uh, was one that I entitled uh, multiple sclerosis vlog pushing past functional reserve. And this was actually the answer to a question that someone left in a live stream. So I'm going to post that pushing past the functional reserve. And so if you haven't checked that one out, um, this was an awesome question that someone asked. What they, what they said was, so the functional reserve, by the way, is the nervous system's ability to withstand an insult. I don't mean you're ugly. I mean an insult like you didn't sleep last night or you have a raging infection with a fever. So, the, so um, one way to think about it is that the functional reserve gets smaller as you age. So I like to remind people, when I was 18, I could skip a night of sleep and just sleep the next night. But now in my mid forties, like saying that to you makes me tired. And so my functional reserve as I've aged has gotten smaller. In the setting of MS, it gets small really fast. And a small functional reserve means that it doesn't take much uh, before you've spent all your energy and you really start to manifest neurological problems. Um, and, and so I made a video where I answered the following question. If you push past your functional reserve a lot, frequently, uh, does it make you worse? And so I answered that question uh, in this video, and I would love to know what you guys think about it. Uh, this video on pushing past functional reserve, let me take a look and see how we've done, has 2,400 people that have seen it. Uh, this week. And if you've checked it out, uh, leave me a comment and let me know what you thought of it. I thought it was an awesome question. Uh, let me know what you think of the answer. And also, let me know if you like these one-off little videos that I make where I'm answering a given question. Let me know if that makes sense to you or uh, whether you'd rather see me answer multiple questions in a video. This one's, you know, they're shorter. That was only four minutes and it was really intended to, to answer a direct question. So let me know what you think. Uh, the last video that I'm going to put forth, I've already actually talked about, and that was the steroids, giving steroids video. So thank you for going over that with me. And similarly, if you guys uh, saw that steroids video, let me know what you think. Um, I'm really keen on making videos that you enjoy watching uh, because that's what I'm trying to do here is educate you in a way that you receive the information well. So if those videos work for you, let me know. If those videos don't work for you, um, let me know that also. All right, so let's see if we've had any other questions. It looks like there's no uh, copied over questions at the moment. And so I'm gonna go back to some of the questions that I was asked before in previous live streams that I wanted to address now. And this is a personal question that um, Janiel Hugh asked. So uh, Janiel uh, writes, personal question. After having grown up uh, in your own personal village of MS, then becoming an MS neurologist. What new knowledge of MS surprised your inner child the most? And what childhood knowledge helped you the most now? So that's a pretty hardcore question. So as many of you know, I got involved in MS uh, from my earliest memories. My uncle had MS and I decided to be an MS doctor when I was 12. And so um, Janelle's, uh, and if I'm not, Janelle is, is asking the question, given that you grew up in a family with MS and now you're an MS doc, how has one influenced the other? So I thought that was a really cool question. Now, I haven't planned an answer, but let me, let me try to answer you um, honestly off the cuff. Um, I remember as a child, 
remarking that my uncle's personality changed and that his cognition changed um, and that his voice changed. So when I, you know, I, I first learned about a spastic dysarthria from MS, listening to my uncle's voice change. Uh, and I am very sensitive to changes in personality and mood um, and cognition in MS because some of my earliest memories of him were that. And so maybe the inner child brought that forward and sensitized the adult neurologist to be really keen seeing that. Uh, and so that was one thing. Um, the, the other thing that I brought forward uh, was what it means to be a family of someone with MS. And this is probably even a bigger thing. The, the biggest impact that I saw wasn't uh, my uncle's. My uncle really didn't talk very much. Um, I wasn't like uh, super close with him. He wasn't really close with many people. Um, but my grandparents uh, were very, very important to me. Uh, my grandfather, Papa, um, was one of the most influential people in my life. And he cared for his son with MS. And I watched him care for his son. And so he taught me what it meant to be a caregiver. At a young age, he disimpacted my uncle. He changed my uncle's uh, superbuted catheter. He would apply the wound vac to my uncle. Um, he would turn him. He would sleep by his bedside sometimes. And so I got to learn firsthand what it means to care for someone with MS and how MS can affect a family. So I guess that's the first part of the answer. Now, um, the second part of the answer is what would the child be surprised by? I, I think that I would be surprised by the therapeutic inertia and how many clinicians uh, don't act uh, in the modern era. And so my inner child's really pissed off about that because um, there are therapies and, and drugs and medicines that are available today that my uncle didn't have an opportunity to take. And I think that the onus is on the practitioner to bring that forward to the patient. And sometimes they don't. And so that makes me super upset and sad. That was an intense question. Um, thank you for asking it. It was pretty heavy. Uh, and I'm glad that I could share that with you guys. All right. So here's another question uh, from the live stream. This question is from Gwendolyn G, who asks, how does high blood pressure affect MS? So that's a really important question. So Gwendolyn, we now know, as of just a couple of years ago, that People with MS that have high blood pressure worsen in their disability faster. They actually get worse faster as compared to people with MS that have a lower blood pressure. So if you have high blood pressure, you should have that treated so that you don't die of complications like stroke and heart attack. Yes, but it also makes MS get worse faster. And one of the theories is that having high blood pressure hardens your arteries and accelerates aging, and so does MS. And so it can be cumulative. But the bottom line is it's bad for MS. Uh, we don't want you to have high blood pressure. And so uh, when I notice that a blood pressure is elevated in clinic, I make sure that I write a note to the primary care doctor to ask for assistance uh, because I am not up in an expert on treating blood pressure and PCPs are awesome at it. And so this is an opportunity for collaboration where I say, hey man, I noticed the blood pressure is elevated. That could make the MS worse. I wanted to make you aware and please help brother out and help me get this patient's blood pressure back under control. And they are awesome at that. And they do that really well. That was a good question. All right. So let's see if there's another question that I had prepared. Here's one. So this was a question asked at a previous live stream by Stephen. So Stephen writes, hi, Dr. Roster. Well, hello, Stephen. Steve from the UK. So I think it's awesome that people are writing in from the UK. Stephen writes, I follow other on YouTube and I wondered what you think of these others who try to help um, and do you like any of them so youtubers um, I I don't have any other like MS doctors or clinicians that I follow at all on YouTube uh, I use YouTube as a way of sharing information and medical education to try to power energize people impacted by and separate from that, uh, YouTube is a place for me to chill out. You know, in my house, we don't have cable. Uh, and so we watch uh, things like Netflix and we watch YouTube. And so I have a bunch of YouTubers that I love and that I follow routinely, but that's related YouTubers. Um, and they have interests 
um, if we're not directly related to medicine. So I have a couple YouTubers I watch uh, that live off the grid uh, and they survive in uh, completely natural environments or completely off the grid. Uh, I have YouTubers I watch that are, um, that are blacksmiths uh, and I love watching them create things out of metal. The YouTubers that do analysis of fighting. Uh, so I have a guilty passion for mixed martial arts. Um, and I know a neurologist probably should not endorse people like punching and choking each other. Uh, but I think it is one of the most pure and beautiful um, uh, uh, physical activities. And so I watch a lot of uh, YouTubers that break down uh, striking and, and grappling. So, um, but to answer your question, I, I don't know about uh, other other folks um, out here sharing MS education. And if I was uh, on MS, uh, my buddy Stuart Sloshman has a really great organization called MS Views and News, and some of the who's who in MS do lectures uh, with that organization, and he has a giant repository. Um, and so you might question, all right. And the last question that I had prepared from before. Uh, also was asked by Mandy Go, and said, how is transverse myelitis related? And what I assume she means is, how is transverse myelitis related to multiple sclerosis? So if you look at the word, I'm gonna try to, uh, I'm gonna try to write this out, and I'll see if I can show it to you. Myelitis. So I don't know if you can see that word. So myelitis. So if we, Split the word here. So Milo, Milo means spinal cord. Itis, I T I S, means inflammation, like bronchitis or um, pneumonitis or uh, and itis or bursitis. Means so what? What myelitis means is inflammation of the spinal cord. Transverse means that it's affecting both the left and the right side, but they don't have to be equally affected. So transverse myelitis is a description. Uh, the question is, what caused the transverse myelitis? So there are many, many different causes of transverse myelitis. Um, the most common is probably multiple sclerosis, but there's many, many others. So there's a cousin of MS called neuromyelitis optica spectrum disorder, or NMO. Uh, there's an anti mog that can cause a transverse myelitis. There are conditions like uh, Sjogren's syndrome, sarcoidosis, uh, multiple different kinds of infections, uh, tumors, spinal uh, strokes can all cause uh, different uh, transverse myelopathies or transverse myelitis. But I think the connection here is the most common uh, cause of transverse myelitis, as I consider it, is multiple sclerosis. So it's a very common presentation in MS. In fact, um, a good portion of first presentations, clinically isolated syndrome, are transverse myelitis. Uh, great question. Okay, so jumping back into the live stream, um, there's 122 of us still online. Thank you guys. I, I love you. Uh, there's 137 thumbs up. If you're digging what I'm doing, thank you very much. Um, and, and maybe give it a thumbs up. And so, uh, one other topic that I wanted to discuss was the MS walks. And so this is my team shirt. We believe in we. Um, there's Ohio Health. And so the Ohio Health MS Center um, and the Ohio Health, the parent organization where I work, um, uh, sponsored uh, the Columbus Walk um, and had a giant team there. Uh, it was really awesome uh, to be there in a big group. Uh, and to be present and represent our center um, and support our patients. Uh, my uh, family went, I love going um, with my family. We go basically every year. It was at the Columbus Zoo, which in and of itself is freaking awesome. Um, I saw some grizzly bears today that were so enormous, it's hard to uh, fathom how big they are. We saw lions and, and uh, giraffes, and it was just really cool. Um, and so that was a great experience. It's an opportunity for a community to come together uh, for a good cause. The National MS Society uh, does a lot of good. They have funded many of the fellowships that I have used to train folks in MS. Uh, and uh, they, they put a lot of money into research. Now, I don't know if you can hear that bell. My dog is ringing the bell to say she wants to go outside. So please don't leave. There's 94 of you. I'm going to be right back. Please, please don't leave. 
I'll be right back, guys. Coming right back. And here I am. All right, and I lost one of you. Sorry about that. Um, my bell, and it, it's not so much that she would uh, make a, an accident in the house. She'll just sit there and keep ringing it until I come and let her out. So I thought it was best if I get her out offline. I apologize to you. Uh, last week, my family drove to Dayton, Ohio, which is about an hour and a half away, and we participated in the Dayton Walk. Um, I love the MS Walks. Um, it's an opportunity to, if you guys participate in MS Walks, so if you participate in MS Walk, leave me a comment. Um, um, tell me which MS Walk you participate in or uh, ones that you've done in the past. I would love to hear from this global online village um, how many of you have done that. Uh, that would be really interesting, so please consider doing that. All right, I think we're going to wrap up. The reason is I, I have to go to the bathroom. I've had a bunch of these. And I don't think I can hold my bladder much longer. I'm going to take one more question, and then we're going to wrap it up. So Joan asks, uh, can you have NMO and MS? No, I, I don't think that's possible. I think sometimes NMO is mistakenly diagnosed as MS. Um, actually, that that's probably happens way more than we realize. In fact, the pathology of both are very, very different. I've never heard it, excuse me, I've never heard it reported ever. Um, there's answer. Emma Roberts asks, um, ataxia is permanent or does it go away? So ataxia, difficulty with, with balance. And Emma, as I wrap up today, I have an entire playlist on balance in my channel. So go to the playlists and there's a, a balance playlist, which addresses that question. My name is Aaron Boster. Thank you for learning about MS with me. Thank you for helping me get to 11,000 subscribers. Thank you for your participation on this channel. Um, I love the comments. I love hearing from you guys. And, and this is such a wonderful uh, online village. So until my next live stream or until my next video, this is Aaron Boster saying take care, guys.